Heath is wondering what Mike's thoughts are on the eternal sonship doctrine. Yeah, I think the best way to answer this is I don't believe in adoptionist Christology. So, you know, Godhead thinking is clear to me uh, in the Old Testament. You know, you have the binatarian thing. Once you understand binatarianism, you're going to see places where the spirit is brought into the discussion. You're going to see the spirit talked about in similar ways that the second Yahweh figure is talked about. And if we have a Godhead, that means you have three persons who are co-eternal. So I would be in the the e- eternal you know, sonship. I'm trying to remember what the terminology was here exactly, eternal sonship, because eternal sonship is related to, but not the same as, the eternal subordination, you know, subordinationism or not. So without you know, going down too many rabbit trails here, I think the best way to just answer this question is I don't believe in adoption as Christology. Uh, Godhead thinking is clear to me in the Old Testament. And if that's the case, you know, when it gets carried over to the New Testament where Jesus is the second Yahweh figure and then the Spirit is but isn't Jesus, there you have your three, you have Trinitarianism. You don't need an adoptionist model in the New Testament if you have Godhead thinking go all the way back into the Old Testament. Heath's second question is, If a binatarian accepts the orthodox Trinitarian's view of the Father and Son, but differs on the personality of the Holy Spirit, would a Trinitarian still be able to view that binatarian as a brother in Christ? Well, I'm going to assume here that when he says differs on the personality of the Holy Spirit, that what he means is doesn't think the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. That, that's, a, that's actually a different question than whether the Holy Spirit is a person or not, but I think that's probably what the question intends. Um, so let, let's say, can, can a person who's binatarian and not Trinitarian, Trinitarian you know, still be considered a, a brother in Christ or something like that? that that's what I'm hearing in the question. Uh, I, I would say, um, I think that failure to see the three in one in Scripture is just that. It's a failure. You know, again, once you understand binatarianism, Trinitarianism derives from two trajectories, essentially. You know, you've got two powers language applied to the spirit. In other words, the spirit is brought into the discussion. And again, not made precisely and, and totally distinct from the other two, but the spirit is talked about in the same ways, in particular, as the second Yahweh figure gets talked about, minus the embodiment. But there's this blurring of the spirit. The spirit is brought into the conversation, as it, as it were, with the invisible Yahweh and the visible Yahweh, you know, the anthropomorphized Yahweh, and they are interchanged. I mean, that, that's one trajectory. And then second, seeing how Jesus is the second Yahweh figure, the second person, and then noting how the New Testament identifies the spirit with him, with Jesus in certain passages. You know, and, and I talk about this in un, Unseen Realm a lot, where at least, at least I spent a couple pages on it. You have passages where the Spirit of God, the phrase the Spirit of God, occurs in tandem with the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of Christ. Okay, it's, it's, it's the same person. You have Paul say on two occasions he refers to Jesus as the Lord, who is the Spirit. So you have this sense that, that just as Jesus is but isn't God, okay, he's the Son, he's not the Father, but but they're still the same. You know, it, Again, th- this whole Godhead talk that we're used to that is also, again, used to be part of Judaism because of the two powers issue. So Jesus is God, but he also isn't the Father. Well, the Spirit is but isn't Jesus. And 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 once you see how you know Jesus is the focal point for both the Father and the Spirit, that's where actually where Trinitarianism derives from. So I I think the failure to see that is just you know, kind of not knowing your Bible well enough, or, or or maybe not knowing what you're looking at might be a better way to put it, because typically the way Trinitarianism is talked about it, it's proof texted. And I think we, we're much better off, you know, to go beyond proof texting. But again, having said all that, if people can't see that, they aren't damned, okay? Since salvation isn't about the ability to articulate theology, not not just theology of the Trinity, but theology on a whole, a whole bunch of things. Romans 5, 8 doesn't say that Christ died for us while we were articulating Trinitarianism correctly, or on the condition that we successfully articulated a Trinitarian theology. It doesn't say that at all. 
John 3.16 doesn't say whosoever believes, or it, it says it, it says whosoever believes in Christ, again, the one God gave to be the Savior of the world, you know, will be saved. It, it, it doesn't say, you know, that whosoever understands how to navigate adoptionism, eternal sonship, subordination. It, it doesn't say any of that. You know, brother in Christ, which was part of the question, is a phrase used to believers, those who put their entire hope of eternal life and forgiveness of sin integrating no merit of their own on the work of Christ on the cross. That, that's what makes you a believer. And, and it's, it's, an, it's an exclusive thing. There are no multiple roads to salvation. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, no one comes to the Father except through me. You know, he, he, he doesn't say, you can get through me once I, I hear you successfully articulate Trinitarian theology. It, it, it just doesn't say that. You can get lots of doctrines wrong and still believe that there is no other means of salvation. In other words, you can believe the correct object of salvation, and you can and you you can believe the necessity of believing in that object of salvation, and still not be able to articulate very well how it all works, or why we need the incarnation, or or, or why there is a Godhead. You, th- those are related but distinct things. Okay, they're they're not. You, you can't exchange understanding of the Trinity with belief in the gospel, that you can't swap those in and out and have the same result. You can, have, you can have someone who can articulate Trinitarianism perfectly, and if they don't believe that Christ is the lone you know, way of salvation and put their trust and faith in him, they're not a believer. They're a good theologian, but they're not a believer. These are not one-to-one exchangeable things. So, you know, they're not damned. I would say, you know, if you go back, you can find references to the Arians, again, back at the Nicene controversy, the losers. And they denied the eternality of the sun. You know, they believed there was a time when the sun was not. You know, they, so they didn't see Jesus as fully God. But nevertheless, they did see Jesus as the sole means of salvation. And they get referred to as brethren. I mean, there are places where that, where that happens. They're, they're, not, they're not considered non-believers. They're considered to have aberrant theology by the decision of the council. And I think we need to, you know, remember this and, and apply it to our own situations. Now, you know, somebody might think of, of, you know, 1 John, you know, John's talk about unbelievers not believing, quote, that Christ had come in the flesh. Okay, well, that, that really isn't about successfully articulating Trinitarianism. It's really about rejecting that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. Okay, the Messiah come, you know, uh, you know to, to deliver Israel. Um, if you look at 1 John 4, for instance, verses 2 and 3, you know, think about what, what this says. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Notice the two polar opposites. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Okay? Then how do you wind up being not from God? It doesn't say that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not from God. That isn't what the verse says. It says every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So this, this you know, John's idea about Christ coming in the flesh is, is, is really about and ultimately about accepting that Jesus was the Messiah. Again, the Savior, the one who, you know, who is, was sacrificed, who was given by God to take away the sins of the world, John 3, 16. If you reject that, okay, then that's not from God. You know, many Christians who would embrace the exclusivity of the gospel today wouldn't have a prayer of successfully articulating the subtleties of adoptionism, subordinationism, eternal sonship, etc. Hey, when I became a Christian, I didn't know about any of that. I wouldn't have had a prayer to, to have an intelligent discussion about any of that. But I understood what the gospel was and why I needed it. And that there was no other way of salvation. And I, I just think we, we need to, to keep some of these things in perspective. So no, they're not damned. You know, I think, I think they're incorrect in their theology. But these, Trinitarianism is not one-to-one each, 